uh, more from Caroline and Sarah quite soon. I'm now delighted to be joined by Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, very good to see you today, First Minister. Um, if I could just start with uh, the Prime Minister's speech. She came up with a plan to keep the costs of trading with the EU as low and frictionless as possible. Mm. You should get behind her, shouldn't you? Well, I guess on the upside, Theresa May provided more detail than we've had before. She also injected something of a dose of realism into the discussions. And let's face it, 20 months on from the referendum, that's the least that people uh, can expect. But if you look at the detail, what she's setting out is an approach that is pick and mix the kind of three pillar approach that has already substantially been rejected by the European Union. So whether that takes us any further forward, I think is an open question. And we might uh, find out more about that when we see the EU guidelines later this week. But, but can I just ask And on the can realism can I... point, what she's, so what she's just... effectively saying on the realism side of it is that we're all going to be worse off at the end of this process, it wasn't a speech about benefits to be gained. It was very much a speech facing up to the lost opportunities of Brexit. But uh, the reality is, the political reality, is that the rest of the EU is much less likely to accept her proposal if they see a divided Britain. So aren't you, in a sense, doing both Scotland and Britain down by undermining the Prime Minister? Well, I don't think it would be right for me as First Minister or for anybody else active in politics to keep quiet when we think that the approach being followed is going to do significant damage to our economy, society, uh, reputation in the world, not just now, but perhaps for generations to come. I think, and everything that I heard from the Prime Minister on Friday seemed to underline this point, that if we're leaving the EU, which, as you know, is something I deeply regret, then the least worst option is to stay within the single market and the customs union and the five tests she set out on Friday would all be best fulfilled by doing that. And, you know, what she was saying, and to give her some credit, she was being much more honest about this than we've heard from the government before. We're going to go through this very complicated, long drawn out, difficult process and end up worse off at the end of it. Now, why would the First Minister of Scotland or the First Minister of Wales or anybody else who's interested in the long term prosperity of the country just accept that? I don't believe that even those who voted to leave the EU, and I respect their opinion, were voting to make themselves or anybody else worse off. But that's going to be the outcome of this. And I think it makes it all the more important that people like me continue to argue for what I would consider to be a much more common sense approach. Now, she wants technological solutions to the Irish border problem as an alternative to staying in the customs union and the single market. If she were to succeed with those technological solutions, that would be good for you, wouldn't it? Because that would make an independent Scotland a more credible option because you would find it easier to continue to trade with the rest of the UK in those circumstances. So, again, you must want her to succeed with that as an option. Well, I want us all to stay within the customs union. I want the UK as a whole to stay within the customs union and then these problems don't arise. But, of course, I, I don't want to see a border in Ireland. I think one of the most shameful features of the whole Brexit process has been the way, in, the negligent way in which the interests of Ireland have just been cast aside. So when I hear her talk about technological solutions, I, I guess there's nobody who would disagree with the objective she's setting, but she's talking at the moment about technological solutions that perhaps don't even exist. And it underlines this point that we are 20 months on from the referendum. We've got about six months of negotiating time left. And only now is the UK government getting into the position where it's facing up to some of these realities. And if we decide to stay in the single market and the customs union, I certainly welcomed the Labour shift towards the customs union earlier in the week. I hope we see a similar move on the single market. Then a lot of these problems disappear. It's not the ideal option. The economic analysis shows that that will still mean a hit to our economy. But by far, it's the least worst option. And time is running out. The clock is ticking. But that makes it all the more important that those of us who want to see an option like that raise our voices and argue for it, try to build consensus and coalition behind it, rather than just accept the inevitability of 
perhaps a disastrous outcome to these negotiations. And just to be clear, where are you currently on the issue of whether there should be a second vote for the British people on this? Well, I, I've said before, it's not something that I'm pushing at the moment because I think it's much more important at the moment to try to be a voice arguing for a common sense outcome. But one of the things I am increasingly worried about is that we get to the autumn, to the end of this next phase of negotiations. And because these contradictions and complexities haven't been resolved, uh, we end up with a very vague outcome and the UK is left facing the prospect of leaving the EU next March or March 2019 without really knowing what the future relationship is going to be in detail. And I think at that point, uh, there will be perhaps a clamour of voices saying that, that people's interests shouldn't simply be cast aside like that. So, you know, I, I'm focusing at the moment. I think there is every reason to continue to try to build that consensus behind continued single market customer union membership. But, you know, I, I, I become more and more doubtful that by the autumn of this year we're going to be any further forward in knowing what the future relationship is than we are at the moment. Now, in terms of the powers of your government, um, David Liddington, who is on the programme in just a few minutes, said recently in a speech, I thought that he would return or give to Holyrood the sorts of powers you were fearful you wouldn't get once we leave the European Union. So will you now give a commitment to back the EU withdrawal bill? Uh, no, I won't at this stage because we haven't reached the agreement that uh, we would need to reach. And uh, I should say the Welsh Government are in exactly the same position. But were as the you Scottish encouraged government. by what you There's heard from issue... David Eddington? <clears throat> Well, there has been movement on the part of the UK government. We've welcomed that, but it doesn't yet address the issue of principle at stake. You know, we accept, as do Wales, that there will be areas where common frameworks across the UK make sense. That, that would probably be the case if, if when Scotland becomes independent. But the question is, who decides? And at the moment, the UK government's proposition is that even in areas of devolved competence, agriculture, the environment, fishing, justice, uh, they should be able to impose frameworks on Scotland and Wales. Our position is that where they're in devolved areas, it should be only by the consent of the Scottish and Welsh Parliament. So I hope we can reach agreement. We're working hard towards that, but I'm going to be continue to be frank about it. There's an issue of principle at stake that we won't compromise on, because if we did, we would allow Westminster to exercise a power grab on the responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament. And I don't think any First Minister worth their salt should agree to that. And, and just very briefly, unfortunately, we're almost out of time. It's International Women's Day uh, tomorrow. Jo Swinson, the Liberal Democrat, has said that all politicians should get behind a campaign to celebrate the achievements of Margaret Thatcher more because she broke through <laughs> the glass ceiling and there should be statues of her everywhere. Would you back a statue to Margaret Thatcher in Scotland? <laughs> Well, steady on. But <laughs> what I do agree with uh, <laughs> is, is that women are not recognised uh, as much for their achievements as men are. Uh, statues have their place. And if you go to George Square in Glasgow, for example, the only woman, I think, is, is Queen Victoria. So, uh, but, you know, in terms of women in politics, I think the legacy I want to see women uh, leave is not so much in the form of statues, but in the form of how much progress they make for the next gener generation of women coming behind us. Great to talk to you as ever, First Minister. Hope to see you again soon. Don't Good go away, you. because after the break, I'll be talking... You're not going to believe this. Brexit. That did surprise you, didn't it? With Theresa May. Mr. Fix-It, David Liddington.